Hello there. Hello. Welcome, everyone. And good morning or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are from the world. Uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to this seminar. Uh, organized by the uh, by GAIN, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition in the run-up to the UN Food Systems Summit. I'm Shuli Ghosh and I'm delighted to be hosting this discussion over the next hour for the 42 actions to improve food systems. Now, we're very lucky today. We have some excellent speakers, uh, experts in their fields who are going to help us explore the kind of uh, decisions and policies and actions which decision makers and others can take to improve diets across all food systems and to make sure that healthy, nutritious meals are available, accessible, affordable and appealing. So let me quickly introduce our uh, panelists to you, first of all, who you can see on your screens there. Uh, Corinna Hawkes, the director of the Centre for Food Policy at City University of London. Uh, Cherry Asilano, founding farmer, CEO, and president of Agria International in the Philippines. We have Dr. Adienka Onobolu, a senior advisor on food security and nutrition in Nigeria. We have Maximo Torero, Chief Economist at the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization at the United Nations. And Pawan Agarwal, Special Secretary Logistics at India's Ministry of Commerce and Industry, and also the former CEO of the Indian Food Regulator. Now, just before we start, let's have a little context to this because uh, as you all know, uh, the health and economic burden of malnutrition is huge. Wasting, obesity, diet-related non-communicable diseases, I mean, these are global problems. So reorienting food systems from field to fork can ensure better nutrition, better diets, uh, in short, healthier populations. Now, in January 2020, the Centre for Food Policy at City University of London, GAIN and the Johns Hopkins University began looking at the recommendations made by major international reports towards reorienting food system towards nutrition. And out of 12 reports and something like 200 recommendations, they have come up with a list of 42. These are 42 plausible actions which are relevant to policymakers everywhere. And these actions will really support governments and others to zero in on what they can do to transform their food systems. Now, the potential for improvement is huge because these recommendations, they encompass every part of the food systems chain. I mean, everything from uh, agriculture, supporting farmers, storage, transport, new technologies, financial measures, educating consumers. Uh, it really uh, is a, a whole series of holistic uh, recommendations. And uh, these, uh, any of these measures, implementing any of these actions, uh, will help stakeholders ensure access to safe, nutritious and affordable food for everyone, and also help to build robust food systems, more efficient food systems in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what are these actions? Uh, how much do they cost? Uh, how do they work in different contexts and different countries? Um, these are some of the questions I'll be putting to our speakers. And we also very much welcome questions from you uh, watching in the audience. Um, we invite you to submit your questions through Q&A button at any time during the talk. And we will come to those questions, as many of them as we possibly can. <laughs> We're going to start with one of the authors of the report which identified those 42 actions to fix food systems. Uh, Corinna Hawkes, uh, you of course lead the Centre for Food Policy. Uh, tell us about these actions and policies. Thank you, Julian. It's so wonderful to be here um, talking on this uh, important topic. Uh, thank you very much for uh, hosting this, this webinar today and thanks for the audience for joining. Now, there's a big conversation going on right now about how food systems can work better for nutrition, for better diets, as well as sustainability, livelihoods, economic 
development and so on. And there's all these reports, there's really a lot of reports out there now, a lot of evidence building, a lot of papers uh, around what needs to be done, a lot of opinions about what needs to be done. But um, what, what, it's, it's, what we've done here in that context is that the, the issue here is, is that there's, the scope is so large in food systems and as articulated by the reports, it's easy to get lost in the huge number of possible changes that can take place. In addition, there's a lot of great ideas about that out there, but there's much less robust and rigorous thinking about how in this very large space of systems, those actions which and those ideas out there actually work through the system to increase access, affordability, and indeed aspiration of more nutritious foods and vice versa for the foods that don't promote nutrition and health. So we haven't really had a, a, if a people-centered approach, if you like, to really thinking through how these actions and food systems are really going to affect change in diets on the ground. And then on top of that, there's a situation where uh, there's a lot of different views, there's different camps. People saying, well, we need to focus here and other people saying, we know we need to focus there. And there's diverging and frankly, often conflicting opinions about, about what to do. So what we've done in this document is to bring together the collective knowledge out there in evidence-based reports to articulate the policies and actions on the full scope of actions and give an indication about how they need to be designed and executed to actually have a clear pathway uh, to impact. And I'll, I'll give some examples in a minute. So each action is carefully worded um, to include the different elements that it needs to have to create impact. And what this does is to provide to policymakers, to businesses, to program leaders, et cetera, a very concrete sense of what they can do to change their food systems and nutrition. Options that they can pick from, select, implement in their local context, preferably as a package. They won't be able to do all of them. Um, uh, they won't be able to do all of them well, or they're unlikely to, but they will be able to, to have a list which shows there are ample opportunities to help make healthy diets available, affordable and appealing. They do have to be carefully designed. They do have to be carefully thought through if they're going to have impact. But the message is here, there's no excuse not to act. There are some clear actions here that can be taken in different parts of the system. And it's not a random list of ideas. It's based on an extremely rigorous, um, very thorough process with lots of depth behind it. And on my slides, I would like to quickly set out what process we use to come up with those 42 actions. So if I can confirm that my slides are now uh, being shown, um, I'd like to move on uh, to the first slide on the, the process uh, that we took. And in that process, we started by um, identifying evidence-based expert reports and selecting those which were really focused on actions that can have a pathway uh, to impact. And then uh, we extracted the recommended actions from those reports, and there were hundreds of them. And we only included those which, uh, only identified those which had this clear pathway towards increasing availability, affordability of nutritious foods and vice versa for the foods which are not um, going to promote good nutrition. And then we took each of those actions and we combined and consolidated similar actions from different reports, but making sure that we brought in the different elements of the evidence behind them to make sure that we were making a relatively holistic action that could actually have impact. Then we developed a pathway to impact through for food supply chains, food environments and consumer behavior for each of those actions so that we could be sure they at least had the potential for impact, even though, of course, they do need to be well designed in practice. And what we came up with, which I'm showing, I hope, on my next slide, uh, headed agricultural actions. 
uh, is these are some examples of the actions um, that we selected. And we divided them into categories. And there are different types of categories. That's the best we could do. There's no perfect categorization of actions which are fundamentally linked across the system. But what you can see in this top action here on agricultural actions, for example, is that we talk here about um, uh, delivering agricultural extension programs. Typically, you'd get an action that said, have an agricultural extension program. But what we've noted is if that's going to be effective, you also need to invest in infrastructure. You also need to invest in education and to support farmers, not just growing nutritious foods, but also marketing them. And that's an example of how we're bringing some more detail into these actions about what you need to do to actually make sure they have impact. And the other thing that we did is to make sure that we were targeting specific foods and being clear about what foods we were talking about, as well as the target audience. Uh, so, for example, um, if uh, if you look down at some of the actions um, here, you can see that the uh, action on redirecting agricultural subsidies is not just about improving access to nutritious foods, but the goal is to is to reallocate them in also that they actually reduce the availability of foods which are built from ingredients that don't offer much uh, to nutrition and health. On the next page, uh, we have the this is the full list of categories that I'm showing here. Uh, there's another example of an action which is a regulatory action about mandatory limits on fat, sugars and salt, and that can affect as another category uh, also affect foods high in fat, sugar and salt, and it would be applicable to all populations. Whereas the action which is around business incentives, again, that action has been designed because we know that businesses have got plenty of incentives to produce healthier foods to people who already favour health and well-being and have the money to buy those products, but are doing much less to for lower income populations and that's an example about thinking a bit more deeply about how the action can actually have impact so these are the actions um, that we've developed i've tried to give a flavor of what we try to do the robust process and uh, encourage uh, those who engage with these actions to really look at some of the detail that we've put in there thank you one quick question for you, Karina, because I, I know you're, you're passionate about um, these being sort of concrete examples, concrete actions which policymakers can take uh, to make a difference. Um, and it, it's not the case that we're expecting decision makers and policymakers to implement the whole lot of them. Uh, to reiterate, uh, any of these uh, actions and policies can make a difference. Absolutely. And that's what the process was designed to identify is that all of them have the potential to make a difference. And so there's a fantastic range to select uh, to select from. There is no reason, uh, there is no excuse not to take action. And now that these clear, clear concrete list of 42 actions have been listed. OK, we'll look at those in more detail a little later on. Um, let me bring in uh, Cherry Atalano um, of uh, Agria International. Okay, Cherry, um, uh, I will, in order to hear your comments, I'll need you to unmute your, uh, your microphone. Um, but let me ask you, uh, one of the main goals of this report is to eliminate food waste. I know that that is one of the main goals of Agria International. How, how important um, is this report in achieving that? Uh, thank you so much, Shuli. Thank you so much for the organizer for having this. It's such a pleasure to share our work. Uh, based on the 42 action trust, right, I was discussing that um, food wastage is something that we need to address massively because it's one for, it's, it's actually the number one solution to address climate change also if you want to tackle it later on. But based on my observation and a country level action, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the the food waste was actually in massively increasing in, in number, you know, for example, in Philippine setting or in Southeast Asia, food waste was 33% before the pandemic. And during the pandemic, it reached almost 75% because the farmers, they don't have market of their produce and, and uh, they have nowhere to, to, to bring their produce actually. And there's like no training for the farming communities to develop their products in value addition. 
Um, so I will cite two examples on what we did in the country level that actually our government adopted and supportive. Um, my company launched the Move Food Initiative, uh, where the UN right now, through the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, is actually doing a documentation that will be translated to four languages about the work. So we launched the Move Food to help farmers to actually bring their produce to the market. And so far, um, we helped almost 200 metric tons of fruits and vegetables saved from rotting in their fields uh, during the pandemic. And it actually uh, inspired all the local government units that instead of giving processed canned goods and instant noodles to their constituents, uh, that all the more we need to be healthy during this um, you know, this situation, uh, it encouraged them to give fresh fruits and vegetables so that they can help farmers in the process. And then they could also help their constituents to be healthier during this time. And in the process, I think collectively, the government save, you know, in millions of tons of fresh fruits and vegetables. And it actually helped the Department of Agriculture to contribute to to, to con to actually contribute positively on our GDP. Before the pandemic, our our contribution to the GDP in the Department of Agriculture is negative 0.5. And even the pandemic and despite volcanic eruption early this year and 21 typhoons this year plus the pandemic, we made it to positively contribute to 1.5% and this year increasing it to 2.5% contribution to GDP. So in a way, um, it's addressing both the agriculture and the production sector, but encouraging a lot of investment in the agriculture sector, which is actually in the action track. I must uh, comment also on the investment side, right? Because most of the time, especially in developing countries like Philippines included, it's really unlocking the investment, both on the on-farm and off-farm processing that could actually enhance the 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 work on hunger and malnutrition. And on the food waste, I was doing a lot of research because of our work. And I, it so happened that I stumbled upon that large, an area larger than China is used to grow food that is never eaten. 25% of our water in the world is actually used to food production that is going to waste. If we can save one fourth of the food waste of larger economies, UK, Europe, and US, we can feed one fourth of uh, one billion hungry people on the planet. And lastly, I guess my comment is um, on the country level side, we need to reinforce how it's implemented. During this uh, pandemic, we forced our government to actually launch the national food policy with the big support of UNFAO and World Food Program, and we launched it during the World Food Day last October. And this national food policy is actually a multi-sectoral, multi-dimensional approach on solving malnutrition and hunger from the production level, including the industry and as well as how to build sustainable livelihood to people. And lastly, on my final thoughts and the comment is shortening the gap. I think during this pandemic, one of the silver lining is how do we shorten the gap of the trading system? Before the pandemic, for example, in the Philippines, we have eight layers of traders. So when you get the produce from the farmers, it's, uh, you know, it's very affordable farm gate price. But when it goes to the consumers, it's almost like, you know, 100% in terms of, of, the, of the increase in the cost. But with this pandemic, um, with the intervention of my company, we were the first uh, private institution that actually responded to this cost on shortening the gap. So we provided support to farmers bringing their produce to the consumers by really working with a local government unit, private companies that are uh, telling their employees to work from home. So one less stress instead of, of you know, their employees to go to the supermarket, we provide them an access to, to fresh fruits and vegetables in that uh, case. So from eight layers of traders who made it into one. So I think, you know, I can um, uh, get more questions later on and discuss yeah. it further. You thank will, you. We'll so absolutely much. expand on that. Cherry, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, let's uh, bring in um, Adiinka Onobolu, the uh, Senior Advisor on Food Security and Nutrition in Nigeria. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, so uh, looking at these 40, uh, 42 actions, you know, what do you think are the most useful for Nigeria? Uh, thank you very much, Julie. And thanks to the organizers of the webinar. I want to start by saying that in Nigeria, we actually have an agricultural sector food security and nutrition strategy that takes a food systems approach to improving nutrition. So we have a document that is well spelled out and quite a lot of the actions that uh, Corinna talked about are included. But then the challenge first and foremost is the fact that we are still at the point of getting people to understand that addressing issues of malnutrition is a multi-sectoral thing and it needs everybody to work together. When this strategy was launched, we also put together a team called the Interministerial Agriculture Nutrition Working Group. And um, we tried to get everybody, I mean, from health to trade to regulatory agencies to come together so that they will truly understand that if we are to improve the malnutrition indices in Nigeria, we had to start looking at other areas apart from health, because traditionally in Nigeria, malnutrition and the rest is seen as purely in the health domain. And it's been very difficult to change that mindset. Uh, suffice to say that the Interministerial Agricultural Working Group did not work out as we expected because the people that were nominated by these different agencies and different ministries to be part of that working group were not people that could take decisions for their organizations. And also each of the organizations and the ministries and departments, they have not sat down to think through what they need to do. So to Adiyinka, how do you incentivize all those different organizations and I, I presume different stakeholders and even the private sector to come together uh, to improve food systems? Okay, what, what we are doing currently is educating people. Because to start with, if there is no understanding of what each group, what each sector can do to make the food systems deliver healthier diets, you can't even begin to tell them what to do. And secondly, the, the area of uh, showing the policymakers, because we don't have, we have a lot of policies and guidelines and things in Nigeria, but to let people go back into them to see what those policy documents and guidelines say is another problem. So we are working also with the governor's forum, because if you want to give them information, you can't give them a document to read. So we are working with the people in the secretariat to come up with information that is on a page, is pictorial, it's easy for them to understand, and then having people talk to them when they have their meetings so that we keep talking. And also for the private sector, it has been difficult in that we don't even have things like uh, policies or guidelines around nutrition labeling and all the rest. And all these are well laid out in the document. If only we can get everybody that is involved to work together. So each person knows at each point in time what they need to do to get the food systems moving to deliver healthier diets. Right. I, I imagine that is uh, an issue that um, is relevant across uh, many different countries. Um, Adienka, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, well, let's turn to Maximo Torero of the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. It's really interesting, isn't it, hearing uh, perspectives from, from different countries, Maximo. Um, just tell us why do food systems need fixing? So uh, clearly, if we look at, at, at the numbers, uh, which is what FAO does, uh, we have, before COVID-19, 690 million people undernourished. 
COVID-19 is adding 135 million people more undernourished. 144 million people, 21% of children under five years are stunted. 47 million are wasted and 38% are overweight. More than 2 billion people suffer from overweight and obesity. And even worse, 3 billion people cannot afford uh, healthy diets, which is healthy diets are five times more expensive than an energy caloric sufficient diet. So clearly the systems have improved over time because it's true that we have done progress over the years but we are far from achieving our target of 2030. And things because of COVID-19 has been exacerbated. So that clearly put us into the situation that we need to do something, we need to change. And if you add to that the situation with the natural resources and how we are pushing the environment to extremes, plus the issues of emissions, the conclusion is that we need a food system now, an agri-food system, and we call it agri-food system because the agricultural part is also important, not only the production of food, that can produce more with less less use of water, less use of land, less emissions, being more efficient and produce more and more effectively of good quality food so that we can achieve the goal of making healthy diets cheaper. And healthy diets cheaper is not a simple issue. It requires look at the supply and the demand because you also don't want to only lower prices because that will affect producers and a significant amount of our poor population that are smallholder farmers. So, so we need to look at both elements of it. And that's why this is so important to do this transformation. Right. And uh, I know that the FAO supports um, best farming practices in, uh, in the pursuit of disaster risk reduction, the no regrets uh, actions that the FAO is, is taking. How does that play in uh, in terms of better nutrition and food systems? Yeah, so, so the way we look at things and, and we, we last month we produced a report looking at what are the cost effective interventions to achieve SDG2 is basically focusing on, on five dimensions. We, we look at uh, the problem that we want to resolve. So what is really the problem that is not being resolved? And we have a whole program called Hand in Hand to target within countries and identifying why products is not being delivered, how they should be delivered given the agroecological conditions. We second look at the cost effectiveness side. That's very important because we could have good ideas, but if they are not cost effective, then it's very problematic. Third, we look at the trade-offs. Any intervention we do will have a consequence. We'll have a consequence in soil, water, in environment. It will have a consequence on consumers. And it's really important that we take that into account because sometimes the trade-offs are global, are global public goods like emissions. Sometimes they are private. When they are global, there are other policies that can be put in place to minimize those in addition to improving the effectiveness and efficiency of the sector. Fourth, uh, we look if there is a technology in place. We talk a lot about post-harvest and reduction improvement in storage, for example. We just finished a huge assessment of all the interventions in improving the storage facilities. And the effectiveness is very low. Uh, it's not good, uh, meaning that technology has to evolve. We have to improve. For example, people say we use hermetic bags, but to be able to put the grain in hermetic bags to reduce the loss or the presence of aflatoxins, we need to dry the grain. And that requires innovative technologies for smallholders. Most of the drying technologies are for large producers. So we need to figure out if the technology is there or if it is not there, what we need to do and what we need to bring. And finally, we take into account the heterogeneity. A problem in one location could be different in another location. A priority in one location could be different to another location. That does not mean that we can not scale up interventions. Of course we have, but we have to put them in the context and institutionality design of that specific reality. That's how we try to do it and how we try to bring solutions okay. to it. And, and very quickly, uh, Maxima, because uh, we are looking ahead to the UN Summit of Food Systems, what, what are your priorities uh, when it comes to those sustainable development goals related to, to food systems and nutrition? Our priorities right now is SDG2, basically trying to increase, especially focusing on zero hunger, but especially on access to healthy diets, how we can reduce these 3 billion people. SDG1, because extreme poverty is related directly to the reduction of, of undernourishment but also inequalities, SDG 8, is extremely important, SDG 10, sorry, is extremely important because if we want to move out sustainably of, of undernourishment and poverty, we need to reduce inequalities. And the only thing that COVID-19 has seriously done is increase inequalities. And that's what we need to change. And those policies are very difficult to find. We don't talk too much about inequalities. So that's really important for us right now. Maximo, thank you very much indeed. And uh, now let's get the reaction from Pawan Agarwal with India's Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Uh, 
Uh, Pawan, you know, you are a government representative. You're one of these policymakers that this report is aimed at. What do you make of the 42 actions? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Sherry. And uh, I think uh, let me first congratulate Corina and her team to put together an excellent compilation of 42 key recommendations that are relevant for everyone. And drawing upon what I heard from Philippines and Nigeria, you know, there are parallels, but also there are differences. India home to 1.38 billion people. You know, we are uh, a country with a lot of diversity. So, in fact, uh, I did a quick exercise in terms of what government is doing in, on all these 42 recommendations. And uh, pleasantly surprised that in 40 out of 42 recommendations, government has some activities. And only in two cases, we did not have a government-backed activity, but I know for sure that the civil society is working in those two areas. So there is a lot of action, you know, you and they are right on the spot. Or policies with your, your hat on as a former CEO of a, the Indian Food Regulator, are there uh, actions and policies that you specifically would recommend for India, which you're, you're very interested in? Uh, no, uh, I think I would like to say that, uh, you know, these uh, uh, policies and recommendations are complementary. In fact, uh, they have to be taken up as a whole. While each one of them, if done independently, can have produced results, but uh, to have a massive transformation of the system that we are seeking, you know, we must be doing all of them or majority of them concurrently. Uh, what and are the barriers, other... though, Pawan? Because we talked about, um, uh, we've mentioned uh, the need for more investment. We've talked about cost effectiveness. What do you see as the main barriers in uh, policymakers uh, taking on board these 42 actions? Uh, good. You know, I will touch upon four barriers and also have, uh, you know, suggested remedy for it. One is, I think, uh, all these actions lie within the domains of different ministries. And therefore, a coherent approach to this is needed. And unfortunately, like uh, you had in Nigeria or uh, in, in Philippines, we still do not have a food systems policy. We have a national nutrition strategy that largely focuses on nutrition. Uh, so that is one area that we need a coherent action on behalf of the government. Second issue is that uh, wearing my hat of a food, regulator, food safety regulator to say, I think food safety is something that is, you know, the elephant in the room, you know, food ball illnesses, you know, they affect more people than HIV, AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis taken together. I would say the issue of nutrition is also so much linked with food safety. You know, nutrition is having the right diet and avoiding the right diet, which is not healthy, you know, exposure to trans fats, exposure to excess of sugar and uh, 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 bad fat or uh, uh, salt. So I think, uh, the, the, you know, looking at uh, uh, nutrition, you know, forgetting about uh, food safety is a mistake. I think this needs to be corrected. Third is that when we talk of, and I looked at uh, these interventions, the, most of these interventions are on the supply side. Now, when we are looking at interventions on the supply side, what is the incentive that farmer has to produce healthy diets for consumers? He has no incentives, uh, particularly a marginal farmer. How do we incentivize the production system to produce healthy diets is a key barrier, and that can be done through a variety of ways. And fourth, uh, and last point is that consumers should demand healthy diets. And incidentally, while companies that produce unhealthy diets, they produce billions of dollars in advertising and marketing. You know, the diet, uh, the money is spent on promoting healthy diets and bring clarity on what is healthy and what is not healthy diet. They are spending very little. That, and that, in yeah. that context, in that context, I'll just uh, mention that in that context, India launched what is called as Eat Right India movement, which received the top visionary recognition by Rockefeller Foundation in the Food System Vision 2050. I think all countries in the world need something, a massive campaign towards healthy diets. I'll, I'll close here. Thank you. Pawan, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and in fact, you know, Pawan touched on the, the, the two 
either end of the food systems there? Um, what incentives are there for farmers all the way through to consumers at the other end? Um, Cherry, let me come to you first, because uh, let's talk about um, farming and what incentives are needed for farmers to, uh, to grow uh, healthier crops. Oh, that's, that's quite actually interesting, Shirley, right? Um, most of the time, the incentive to farmers to actually grow healthy crops if they have a market. For me, I strongly believe that it's market driven. So like, for example, the concrete action that we're doing right now, this happens just in the last few months during this pandemic. Uh, we're trying to work on the develop the developers of healthy products that are accredited by our government on how to source the raw materials from the farmers so that the farmers have actually secured market. Because if you encourage the farmers to plant something uh, without a market, there's no response or adaptability to it. You know, it's still like... Um, uh, you're in a losing proposition. So right now what we're trying to do is they need to have a um, ability to basically um, do the do the, the active, sorry, I have a little girl here. She's active in this field. <laughs> <laughs> She's actually a proof of concept of first 1,000 days because I got her from the farm, you know, the, um, from a young mother. So she's been with me and, 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 and a testimony of how 1,000 days works. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, going back to my point is encouraging the farmers to actually go in this kind of venture is a secured market. And second one, a strong support from the government in terms of infrastructure. So like, for example, uh, with Maximus' point a while ago on if you demand for grain, you need to build infrastructure to how to dry those grain, how to, to process this grain in a way that it the, 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 the health and the nutrition, the nutrition component of that grain is present. So, and then the food safety in the process of, of, of going through that because, you know, the food and drug uh, authority regulations so should align. So there are so many components in the puzzle that we need to work together. But I guess with government support and intervention and reinforcing it, it can happen. Uh, I, I think it's, it's really interesting that there are um, different issues cropping up in, in different countries. And Karina, I suppose this goes to the point um, that uh, our speakers made um, earlier, that these measures uh, have to be assessed according to specific contexts, specific country needs and specific uh, populations. How have these measures been assessed against the realities on the ground? They absolutely have to be put into context and we're delighted that we're going to be working with the team at the Food Systems Dashboard, uh, where, which provides data on different elements of food systems so that um, th that diagnostic process can be used to then select these different actions for those particular contexts. So um, uh, the, the, the reality is, is that it's up to the people who are designing, developing, um, strategies to look at what the possibilities are for the actions and then to diagnose their situation and identify what solutions are going to be needed in their context. So, for example, uh, we might have uh, uh, some countries where the cold chain isn't very well developed to get nutritious foods for markets. But we might have other countries that have got a, a very well working cold chain, but don't have uh, good, uh, good other types of facilities. The key point is that in every context that you need to get these different components working well together. So as Pawan said, you need to have actions which are focused on the supply side in food environments and on demand and a combination of those actions. As Cherry said, you need to have those which are working on production on stabilizing and securing markets and on infrastructure. So the key is to get the right balance of action, uh, which is appropriate to context. And we're not getting that done quite a well, well enough now. And that's partly uh, because of what Adan Inka said, it's very hard to get other sectors really engaged. And I hope that this list at least will help people see, well, there's a clear list and perhaps I then identify from there what they can do to, to implement it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I know that uh, Maximo, for example, Matt, um, was talking about what, what the possible trade-offs are uh, for these actions. I mean, Maximo, what should, um, how can government
one must be persuaded that this is this is a, a best buy, uh, as it were, when it comes to looking at the costs, the investments needed, and the trade-offs. So, uh, for me, uh, if you have the information, the best buy is the one that is the more cost-effective because we have a restriction of resources, of course. It's properly targeting a big problem, and our one of our bigger problems is access to healthy diets. Uh, and also, it, it identifies the level of trade-offs, and it is the pathway that minimizes those trade-offs. Now, if it is so profitable that can also afford complementary policies to minimize those trade-offs, that would be ideal. And that's what we are looking for. The, the problem we face today is that we normally don't measure those trade-offs. And that's what the beauty of the system, you see. If we're talking of a system, of a food system, agri-food system, we need to interrelate. And the only way you can interrelate is, is if you look at the, at the trade-offs. Everything we do will have a trade-off or it could have a synergy. But normally we don't do that. And I think that's the big changer. And that's the big change game that we want to bring with the, with the Food System Summit. No? Right. I and mean, I can see Adi Inka and Pawan both nodding at that. Adi Inka, what, what are your thoughts on, the, on getting uh, policymakers more, uh, more involved and, and, and trying to get them to work together on this? Well, for me, that is a bit difficult in our setup because um, I'll give an example on food labeling and advertising to children and the rest. These are the companies that pay the biggest tax. The government needs the money to do things. And then you are saying because of the health of the people, uh, this has to be done. So there, there is a lot of dialogues that need to happen. And I'm really glad that one of those is happening already because the vice president of the country is the chairman of the National Council on Nutrition. And about three weeks ago, we had a real sit down and talking through things with him. And he is interested in having a group of people come together to bring out the salient things that need to happen in each of the sections of the economy for us to improve nutrition through the food systems. You know, like we just developed a multi-sectoral plan of action for food and nutrition. And like I said earlier, the, the idea for Nigeria is that nutrition is health. So by the time the whole plan was costed, the highest cost of about 80% went to health. And luckily we had people who, who saw things differently in that meeting because at times when it is between us as colleagues, they don't listen. But when you have other people in the group talking about, no, it must not be this. So they were asked to modify and change things and give importance to the different sectors. So I think in Nigeria, we we'll just continue to dialogue and dialogue until we get there. Over. Yeah, it's clear yes. that a new way of thinking is, is, is uh, necessary. Pawan, what, what did you want to add to it? Uh, I think as Maxio mentioned, you know, more money is obviously needed for, uh, you know, taking up uh, effective action on these recommendations. But far more important is that how that money is used. And even more important than that is, you know, how do we align actions of different government ministries and agencies, and also the private sector, the community-based organization, to think in the same line. And uh, that is very difficult in normal government setup. And that is where India has set an example in terms of uh, instituting this Eat Right movement, where the country's food authority, which I had privilege to lead for four years, is bringing together different ministries and agencies on the transformative agenda that goes beyond food safety, focuses not only on nutrition, but also on sustainable diets, food that is good for people and planet. And I think, you know, that is a model that one can work with. Interministerial agency, a committee itself will not work. Uh, you require a new institutional arrangement to deliver on food system transformation. Okay. And Maximum, I could see you uh, wanted to come in there and comment. No, I, I just wanted to follow exactly what Adeyinka mentioned. I think it's really important this conflict of interest that she was mentioning between a policy of labeling to improve the behavior and to improve what people eat 
and what companies necessarily will do. And, and here is where we need to do the self-soft learning. No? Like for example, Chile has went through all this process. It's one of the few cases where they have evaluated the change of labeling and they have looked at the whole process of how complex it was to convert the companies to agree to this. And they have this system of, of, of lighting, which has worked pretty well, even better than the, than the lighting system that is in Europe. So, so I think it's very useful to learn from those because you are not the first one going through that process in Nigeria. This has been happening in other places. And it's a very tough process. And you have to have a very strong political support and a lot of dialogue, as you said, because companies will adjust. And that's where you need also to take advantage of the summit, because the summit is trying to create the importance of these issues. And that could help you at the corporate level of these big companies, which normally are the ones producing this type of goods, is to help to support these type of changes and initiatives that are needed. But I think learning from others is great in this, in this case type, type of situations. So I want to remind our audience that you can uh, submit questions to our panelists at any time just by typing them in on the screen there. And we do have a question from the audience. Uh, Corinna, this one is for you. Um, is there any guidance or thinking on prioritizing uh, these 42 actions, um, especially for governments which might have uh, constrained resources? Yeah, that's a really great point and why we will be integrating these actions into the food systems dashboard, because what that will do and what that dashboard does is, is to provide data on different elements of food systems so that if a country that will enable a country to say, OK, I've got particularly low vegetable consumption as a nutritional issue. And I also don't have uh, have poor infrastructure in a, a particular element element of the supply chain, and uh, I know that my consumer demand looks like X. Then you can put that together to prioritise which ones are going to be more useful in that particular context. Uh, so that's that's going to be one of our major next steps. But I think there is also a need um, for further guidance and much more specific um, guidance using diagnostic tools. And I would like to see an organization like FAO uh, play a central role in its role in, in guiding governments at, at the national level and making sure that they have the skills and capacity at the national level uh, to diagnose how to prioritize these different actions. Uh, we've had another question about um, the important role of uh, the different sections of the population can play, uh, the importance of youth, for example. Um, Cherry, since uh, earlier we saw uh, examples of youth running around behind you, perhaps you can tell us um, how important is it that young people get involved in this? Oh, very important because they always, you know, share this, that the youth is not the future, they're the now and the current. And they need to be involved in decision making and on how their future should look like, right? Um, I think the youth is very important in terms of communicating it, you know, communicating it to a lot of um, stakeholders. And I guess uh, one insight that I must share in terms of youth is uh, GAIN has a huge uh, project in Bangladesh. I sit in the board of GAIN and we're just talking about adolescence and youth malnutrition. And having that kind of example, it's such a beautiful story to tell that if our youth is actually malnourished, our human capital is malnourished. You'll have in 10 years down the road, you know, or in just like less than five years down the road, you have a very malnourished human capital and it's actually affecting our economy. And, and another one is I work a lot with rural youth in the Philippines. We train more than seven to 8,000 youth in the country, especially in war zone areas. I realized that during um, this most difficult times or even after war, the youth are the first one to move outside their house and, and, and look for something to, to go back and feed their family. So it's a beautiful intervention to actually educate them on what proper, uh, on what proper nutrition is all about and, and on a healthy lifestyle. Second one is the, there's a power of social media and digital platforms right now that a lot of our youth that are involved. Um, communicating all the work that we do, utilizing the power of the youth in mobilizing them, how this 42 action trucks could be mainstream in terms of communication in the future, the power of social media with their presence. It's a, it's a beautiful intervention to be done. Cherry, thank you very much indeed. Uh, another question from the audience, and um, this is quite a, an interesting one. It touches on something uh, you were saying, Pawan, about um, changing consumer uh, behaviors in terms of uh, healthy food. Uh, the question says, uh, actually, a lot of the messages people receive 
um, about unhealthy foods are, are that, you know, they are associated um, with strength, with happiness, with youth. Uh, and and this, these are messages that come directly from um, marketing companies, from uh, food production companies. So how do we need to, how do we change um, what the messages are that are being put towards consumers in order to help consumers change their behavior? I think a very good question because, uh, you know, most of the marketing companies employ very creative uh, people to craft these messages. And we have to be smarter than them in crafting messages for healthier food and healthier diets. And uh, that is precisely what we did under the Eat Right movement. You know, engaged uh, some brilliant people you know, passionate people who could craft messages that appeal to the mind, that appeal to the senses, emotions of the people, and then reach out uh, these messages in very effective way to the population at large. I will give an example. We got a celebrity a actor to make a short film on Aas Se Thoda Kam. We'll start having less salt and sugar, and we said that Aas Se Thoda Kam Aase thoda kam is this, you know. So this became quite popular uh, in India and maybe elsewhere in the world that, uh, you know, from today we'll start taking a little less salt, a little less sugar. It's not about the food that you get in the market. You have to change your habits. You know, you and have to change your taste. The messages which are, are so, getting so out I there. think uh, that is where we have to work with. And uh, Absolutely. I think uh, uh, there's a long way to go in that direction. Uh, okay, uh, another question. I'm going to I'm going to put this on to Maximo and then perhaps get Karina to comment on it as well. Um, when we talk about funding uh, these changes, because uh, obviously you know someone's going to have to pay for these changes, how can new sources of funding be, be found to support these policies and actions? Okay, so essentially right now there is a, a plea for international donors to increase the amount of resources uh, to achieve SDG2. Uh, this has been done uh, through several mechanisms uh, and, and there is an amount that has been put up in terms of resources. So, so yes, there is a need to bring up the importance of the topic and there is a lot of efforts also, especially in emergency situations where these situations are critical to, to raise funds. But on the other hand, uh, it is important to find a way in which we can use our resources more effectively. So as Karina mentioned in one of her, her actions, uh, today agriculture is one of the sectors that is the most distorted in the world. And these distortions come through subsidies and subsidies which not necessarily are, are aligned to what we are talking about. They are subsidies to staple commodities uh, and not to commodities which will improve healthy diets, more high value commodities like fruits, vegetables, and certain types of meats. Uh, so that could help you to basically use resources that you are allocating to a, the wrong incentive towards a proper incentive. So within your own budgets, you can better allocate resources. The other element is efficiency gains. Many of the resources being invested sometimes are not targeted properly and sometimes are not touching the major problem that will give the bigger return. So I think it's not only asking for more money, it's also using the money in a better way. And finally, today, because of the COVID-19, we have a significant uh, increase in, in support from uh, financial institutions, international banks, IOs, uh, multilateral banks. And if we don't put pressure in that that money is directly linked to the problems that we need to solve and to the priority setting that we have in place, then basically the recovery money will go just to budget support and not allocated properly to achieve this goal that we're trying to achieve. So again, we have to put more emphasis on how to set priorities to avoid the money that is being used today is not used properly. Okay, and Karina, uh, final thought to you about what, what would you say to policymakers and stakeholders looking at this and thinking uh, some of these changes require a uh, huge investment? There's already huge investment in the food system. Trillions are spent by the private and the public sector. That can be redirected uh, towards addressing the problem of 
uh, nutritious foods and unhealthy diets. It's a question of spending the millions, trillions in the food system already differently. That includes agricultural subsidies. It includes private sector investment in R&D. Um, it includes the investment funds that are going in from the private sector. And it also includes social protection, safety nets, um, schemes which directly target um, consumers, which can also be uh, targeted towards encouraging the consumption of healthier diets. Corinna, thank you very much indeed. Um, well, that time has flown by, hasn't it? I want now to get some uh, final thoughts from our speakers on their main uh, takeaway from today's discussion or the key message they want to deliver. Uh, and we're going to have to keep it short and sweet, please, speakers, a uh, minute each. Um, Adi Inka, uh, let's start with you. Thank you very much, Julie. What my takeaway from here is that the challenges that we are facing is not, is not just um, for us alone. Other people have faced and we can learn from how the others actually overcame such challenges. And also I will now stop uh, being discouraged when you talk about a thing once and nobody listens. I'll keep going and working with the, my colleagues to ensure that we get where we want to get to. Thank you. That's excellent news. Um, Cherry, final thought from you. I think what I learned from this is actually working on the inequality that Maximo was uh, saying a while ago and the forgotten somehow food safety and you talk about malnutrition. And lastly, the power of women. You know, I always believe in our work in the agriculture sector, once you educate the woman in the household, who is also farming the food, the first intervention is to cook healthy in the household to make the family healthy. And the extra one is going to, to their livelihood or sustainability. I, I believe in the power of family farming that's so powerful in solving the nutrition on a household level. Thank you. Very, thank you. Yeah, and it's really encouraging to see some of the, a lot of those uh, actions are geared towards uh, women. Uh, Pawan, final message from you, please. Yeah, so, <clears throat> From my side, you know, uh, I think uh, multiple actions on many fronts are required, uh, which obviously need coordinated government action with whole of society approach and actions on both the supply side and demand side, focus on demand side, consumer centric demand will push the supply side to healthier diets. Pawan, thank you very much. Maximo, final thought from you. So, uh, uh, the situation that we live today is dramatic. It's four times worse than the previous financial crisis. And we were already in a, in a situation that was dramatic for agriculture, for health and nutrition, especially. And so I think what we need is a post-war play book. Basically, we need to recover as if we were in a post-war and we need to do it now. And we need a huge transformation touching all the topics we have been discussing. But that needs to happen and needs to move and we need to take advantage of this situation rather than to regret it. We need to change. And that agri-food system transformation is now necessary. It has to be like a post-war type of period where we recover from it. Maximo, thank you. And Corinna, final thought from you. Uh, in that context of, of recovery and the situation now, policymakers can act in public institutions, they can pass laws, they can put uh, businesses incentives into place, they can conduct education, uh, they can act directly in agricultural programs, they can alter, make decisions around uh, how to spend money differently. There are many actions, we've listed 42 of them. Uh, there's no excuse not to act and know what to do. However, um, there's many people who are already taking action from which we can learn. What I hope with this uh, brief out today on 42 actions is that we can actually accept that we understand what we need to do and move on to the harder conversation about how we do it, how we execute it, how we get it done, how we break down some of those barriers and conflicts to actually affecting change. So yes, we have produced the what with this report today. Let's use that as the basis for the conversation about how we get this done. Corinna, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all my speakers. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined the webinar today. Uh, the key message, if you want a trusted source of information about how to change food systems for nutrition, this is the go-to list. 
Uh, again, we'll be making the um, link to the report available, uh, also a recording of the webinar. Um, we hope you enjoyed the discussion and wherever you're joining us from, have a good rest of the day.